The Putt Portfolio with Andy McNeil. Hey, welcome to the Puck Portfolio. Happy Wednesday. My name is Andy McNeil. I'm your host. I'm here on weekdays to provide NHL projections, picks, betting advice, and strategies to help you make informed bets throughout the NHL season. Uh, We've got two games on the docket for Wednesday. We've got a bunch on Thursday. We're going to get to those shortly here. But first, I am going to bring in my guest, Nick Martin. How you doing, buddy? Doing good. Yeah, I'm stoked. Good slate last night. Good finish of the season here, so can't wait to get into it. Yeah, kind of a downer for me last night. Um, got the win on the Predators. They won me a, a unit. Um, got some pretty good line value on that one, betting them at minus 125. On Monday night after the the Vegas and St. Louis game wrapped up, uh, they came all the way back. Um, looked like they were going to get smoked in Vegas after and end their uh, point streak. I mean, the, the the Predators have not lost in regulation since uh, since prior to that. You know, you two uh, debacle with the Sphere trip getting canceled, um, and uh, and yeah, it looked like it was going to all end last night. But they came back, and that was uh, that was big for me because I lost a late play on the Winnipeg Jets that I bet shortly before post, and uh, of course the Carolina Hurricanes stymied by. Uh, Jesse Pugliarvi and uh, and Alex Nadelkovich. <laughs> yeah, that was a tough one. I lost on that one too, but uh, that's okay. Caught a couple other winners. So anyways, sure, yeah. we'll move on. Minus, around minus 0.65 unit loss on Tuesday for me. Of course, this show is sponsored by North Star Bets. You can check them out via the link in the description below. They offer early odds on the next day's NHL games a little bit later today, though, had to wait a couple of hours for uh, Thursday's odds to, uh, to get put out, but uh, they're up now. Um, But let's, uh, let's talk about the NHL uh, schedule a little bit before, uh, before we get into the projections. So if you've been here before, you know what you're looking at. Uh, Rest column tells you that there, uh, how many days rest teams have across the NHL, the load column gives you a little bit more context. Uh, of course, tells you if a team is playing back to back, three games with four nights, four games and six nights, etc. Not going to spend a whole lot of time on uh, this here, um, so you can screenshot it if you would like and uh, and take a look at it a little bit later. I factor this into my handicap. So uh, yeah, let's get into the projections. Nick, do you like anything uh, on this uh, two game slate for Wednesday? We've got the Senators taking on the Sabres uh, and the Bruins taking on the Lightning. I'm uh, I'm pretty neutral on uh, on both of these games as things stand right now, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I actually like the Sens to plus 120. I uh, I think that okay. it's still kind of a good time to sell on Buffalo. I've tracked them pretty hard. I was big on them on Saturday or Sunday in Calgary. Couldn't believe they opened as a dog. Um, but I think this is kind of the right time to fade them. Don't love Jonas Corposalo. Feels like that's always the annoying thing with the Sens. Uh, for users who can get like a save prop on Lukanen, I think that could be a decent way to attack it because I feel pretty confident the Sens will hold their share of the play as an underdog. You think Buffalo is going to just keep riding Lukanen here, even against yeah, the he's, Sens? Yeah, he's he's confirmed, and and they're gonna oh, is he? Um, okay. Yeah, and they're like I feel like in their mind they're still competing, right? Look, like, which I respect. You're you're not mathematically eliminated. Um. But I do feel like this is kind of the spot I want to get on the sends. The classic sends late push, win some games as a dog, and and head into the summer feeling good. And people can pump them up as a as a team to to get on next year. Um, but yeah, I, I just I look at the way these teams are kind of skating right now. It feels like a decent time to to buy on the sends and fade the Sabers. Yeah, so I uh, I'm with you as far as liking the the Senators more than I like the Sabers here. Um, I was, you know, probably would have been on the Sens, I think, at uh, at some of these prices, if not for the the Corpus Allo, uh, confirmation. So, um, goaltending matchup, don't really like it, but yeah, Sens are nothing. I think uh, I think, and I'm with you on that. But um, I will. Uh, I'm going to lock in a bet, and I think you like this one too. Uh, it's moved already. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, it was plus one ten. Now it's plus one oh two at North Star Bets. It's the Dallas Stars. They are in Vancouver taking on the Canucks on Thursday. So I'm going to lock in the Stars at plus one oh two for three quarters of a unit. Would have been a one unit play at plus one ten, uh, but yeah, with the reduced price, I'm going to uh, scale that down a little bit and just risk 
uh, three quarters of a unit on the Dallas Stars at plus 102. I don't think they should be an underdog in this game. Uh, what do you think about this one? Yeah, I completely agree. It's funny. I, I think we would have had the exact same unit recommendation at the given numbers. I might have been a little more gung-ho too, but I really need the Canucks to lose some games for some uh, futures I have on uh, the Jack Adams, which I'm hoping are alive. And I'm right with you. I, I think, and I know that the Stars play a lot differently than the Kings. They have much different strengths, but I view this as the exact same thing as that Monday matchup, where right now I think the Canucks are just going to keep playing coin flip 50-50 hockey with any elite team. And I think versus Dallas specifically, they're in with... Uh, a less than 50 50 shot so i'm right with you don't it feels like edinger's getting going a little bit we've probably seen the worst of it and the one thing out prior to that king's game and there were kind of some stupid goals I, I wouldn't it's not like the canucks played bad at all in that game but they have played a lot of soft offenses and they have done a really good job of insulating to smith but i do think that as they play teams like dallas he could become more of a flaw so yeah, I'm never really pumped to bet on Dallas's goaltending situation, but you're still getting a team that is arguably the very best in the league right now at plus money. So I'm right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and they've they've won 62 percent of their road games uh, year to date. So uh, you know, and this this price is a lot lower than what you would see typically on a Stars. Obviously, the Canucks are you know one of the better teams in the NHL in the top half of the NHL, but. You're typically seeing minus 140 on the stars on the road, and here you're getting uh, getting them as a dog. Uh, actually, I'm kind of curious how often, uh, how many times Dallas has been a dog this season because it hasn't been very many. This will just be the tenth time that the stars have been an underdog. Uh, surprisingly, they've only they've lost six of those games. <laughs> so, yeah, and I think the Canucks are just like it. It shows they're just their offense looks a lot flatter than it has. I know, like they scored four versus Montreal. We had talked about how I thought the the refing that game was horrific. Four was probably the best end of things. Same thing in the Calgary game. The Calgary game could have easily gone the other way, but I. And then you look at like the two one loss to Washington. I think all their recent sample just kind of tells you how they're they're going to be in like a lot of these coin flip type games, even with lesser teams. Like the offense just isn't humming like it was, which I know a lot of people have kind of predicted that downfall, and. I just, yeah, for me, I think everyone's going to be on Dallas tomorrow. And I think that's the right idea because I'm really not seeing this one, I guess, aside from maybe if you look at the Canucks, like their record at home over the whole season. But I don't know. Yeah, this this one just didn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, and I think the Stars should be around that uh, minus 106 range, maybe a little bit higher than that. Obviously, a little bit of uncertainty as to who they're going to start in goal. We don't know that they're going to uh, start uh ottinger necessarily um but uh i uh i wouldn't necessarily i wouldn't like them at minus 110 uh really uh and that's what we're probably going to see open up here at a lot of these other sports books so i think a lot of people will be on dallas tomorrow like you said but at a, a minus ev price um another bet that i want to lock in before uh, we get too far into this uh is uh my uh, my second favorite money line play for Thursday, it's the Florida Panthers. Uh, like I said, betting a big favorite in the Hurricanes at minus 172 did not uh, work out for me, but they closed around the minus 190 range. So it was a good price, just didn't uh, didn't get the right result. Um, but I am betting the Panthers at minus 172 to win three quarters of a unit uh, to beat the Islanders. I mean, I just don't you look at you look at how Florida has been priced in their home games and they haven't been great on home ice recently they've lost uh three of their last four i believe um but yeah minus 172 far too short against this isles team who is done like dinner i know they're not mathematically uh eliminated but they have a, a pretty big hill to climb and uh and you're seeing this open up at some other sports books um much higher so DraftKings opening up with florida minus 205 um, and that's I, that's what I think you'll see this. Th that's where I think you'll see this game trend. So I think getting it out in front of that uh, on this minus 172 number currently available at North Star Bets is a very strong play. Yeah, no no disagreement from, from me there, Andy. <laughs> I think the Isles are also cooked. And, and the one thing that I had said with them that I think is just interesting is it feels like some of these games you have gotten a little bit of like do or die pricing. Uh, people kind of buying into that narrative and they did show kind of that short-term surge under Watt. but to me this just looks like a team 
that's aged. The defense core is just like, regardless of how they play, it feels like they're having a hard time reacting to what the opponent is doing, especially when they play a team like Florida. So yeah, I agree. This, this looks short and not a bad spot for the Panthers. Feels like they're kind of, you know, they've got Barkov back in the mix. They've got Forsling back in the mix. I don't think they played overly brutal, like bad versus Boston last night. Just looked like a pretty good game. So it feels like you're kind of, you're getting the right discount on the fact that the Panthers have tailed off a little bit recently, but I don't think anyone questions if they're still one of the best teams in the league. Yeah, for sure. Um, so speaking of uh, Eastern Conference playoff chances, I've got the Flyers uh, at 82.5%. The Caps now, Knicks Caps at 72.9% after that big win um, on uh, on Tuesday against the Red Wings. And as a result, the Red Wings down to 28%. So uh, not looking good for Detroit. And then you've got the Isles at around 10%. The Devils around 5%. Um, Sabres and Penguins, Sabres at 1.1%, Penguins at 1.6%. I think that's just mostly due to the fact that Buffalo does have a really tough schedule down the stretch compared to Pittsburgh, which is not that easy either. Um, but then at the same time, maybe if I just ran some more simulations, uh, that would kind of even itself out a little bit, but um, which I think Stathletes should do too, because their playoff. I saw Greg Wyshynski has tweeted the Stathletes uh, playoff odds um, day after day these these last few weeks, um, and uh, and they fluctuate like way too much when teams don't play. Like when the Flyers haven't played, like and their like odds are changing like five percent even when there's no real. I think you got to run more Sims, people. <laughs> you can't run a thousand Sims and expect to, you know get out all that noise so uh <laughs> but uh but yeah i i uh i like i like the i like how the caps are looking lately but tomorrow's uh tomorrow's games against the leafs is uh, is going to be another tough test obviously toronto just coming off uh smacking washington recently um how do you view this game nick yeah i didn't really have a lean in terms of uh a side i thought it looked like fair um yeah I agree. especially with with like kind of the you don't really know who's getting in for Toronto. I had pointed out yesterday that it was what I viewed was probably a complete anomaly that they had gone 17, two and one without Morgan Riley. Uh, I saw people betting into that trend quite a bit. Didn't think you'd want to buy it. Seems pretty unlikely that a team's actually better without their best defender. And they weren't bad last night. The game obviously could have gone differently, but I do think that that was kind of an interesting thing to think about when people are kind of blindly betting into that and then if you stop and think about it it just didn't really make a lot of sense so um i i, I think like if you could get these numbers on toronto and they were gonna have uh, a healthier lineup and samsonov i i don't hate it but i don't know yeah i mean you know the caps are rolling lindgren and that's gonna give them an avenue so i didn't really have much of a take i have financial interest and personal interest in just the caps winning as many games as yeah. possible down the stretch so um for me just kind of an easy pass i'd say you know like and, and if there's any like i said last time we were we were on if there's if, if you know if there's anything good in the world left the caps having a you know 72.9 percent chance at making the playoffs should mean that spencer carberry has a 72.9 percent chance of winning the it better Jack Adams the because votes, it, it, one one happening should should mean the other happens in my opinion <laughs> yeah especially if the Canucks don't win the presidents because I see it with talk like they're I get it they're they weren't expected much and the president's yeah. trophy winning coach wins it oftenly anyways but still like come on and I honestly I actually think like I've said Burnett deserves it over talk it too at this point because yeah you look at the preseason expectations on the Preds yeah, the way um, he's just changed their game too, right? So hundred percent looks like more of a notable coaching thing than, and I mean, Talkett obviously has made the Canucks a tougher team to play against too, but I think he's working with more uh, star talents as well. Yeah, um, I yeah, I mean, I think Vancouver they've they've according to my projections they've got a ten percent chance of finishing with the most points. The Rangers right now have got a forty five percent chance of finishing with the most points. So. Doesn't look like that is very likely to happen, but uh, but yeah, so um, anyway, looking uh, looking elsewhere, uh, any games that you specifically wanted to hit on here, Nick? 
Yeah, the one that I'm kind of on, and I'm interested because I could see this being a game where like a model is less high on it. I'm giving them credit for what I think is the week where they're showing they're turning it on is the Vegas Golden Knights. They're at plus 114 right now. I do have a play at that number. I've been impressed with what they've done this week. And for me, they're a team that I've said all year, you're kind of, they're tough to handicap. And they, yeah. like it's been half the season where they were below 500. Like they went 19, 20, and uh 20, 19, 20, and two for the 41 games leading into the Blues game. So it's half a season. But you look at how many players weren't even playing in the lineup that are there now. And those players have been learning to play together. And then I do think more than anyone else, you can handicap a little bit of complacency and like, uh, you know, we've played more hockey than everyone else. We don't care about where we seed and all those narratives where I think for other teams, that's probably a lot of noise. Um, I thought they'd turn it on for the Blues game, and I actually thought they played both teams played really well. I just thought it was one of those things the Blues were playing for their season. They they brought kind of their best version of that game, but and then yeah. last night in Nashville they ran out of gas, but still with Patera and Net the way the the Preds been playing, the chances or the high danger chances were fifteen fifteen. From what I saw, that looked to be about a fair take on the game. So I think that the Knights are coming around. I think that two weeks from now, if these teams played, there'd be a pretty good chance that it's close to pick. So uh, I like it. And I'm assuming Logan Thompson will get this game and, and he's looked pretty good recently. So um, I like that. I, I think that it's uh, much closer to 50-50 and that the Knights are going to trend into form down the stretch here. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I mean, I agree with you because like the my model has uh, Winnipeg priced at minus 126. Um for this game, which I think I believe is about the midpoint price. If the Golden Knights are plus 114, then that means the Jets are around minus 135 ish, somewhere around there right now. So, um, yeah, pretty much at the midpoint price here. Uh, so probably no action on this one either way, but I do like arbitrarily, I, I do agree with you wholeheartedly. And, uh, and I also don't think the Jets are looking very good recently. A lot of, I think their pricing is, being uh you know propped up a little bit with what they did earlier in the season and the way that they were playing uh pretty dominantly but um yeah i mean look they've looked pretty mediocre and edmonton although the game was close um i thought that the Oilers uh, obviously looked much better than the jets on uh tuesday so yeah, yeah. it feels like the jets are kind of becoming more that team people thought they'd be where it's kind of like a wild a wild card uh, level team yeah. like I think they're kind of more comparable with like in Nashville than uh, these other top top sides right now especially with Lardy out like he's only one one guy but he is a two-way force and that top line's kind of getting exposed a little bit with uh, Connor and Shifley starting to look kind of more like their former selves in terms of the defensive side of things so yeah I like it yeah for sure um Money Puck has the Jets at 54, 55.4%. But um, I just took a screenshot of their Thursday odds because I do like to look. I think it's hilarious how much they change from uh, one day to the next once the betting lines come out. So in about four or five hours from now, the market's going to be, you know, more or less mature at that point. Um, and uh, and they're going, you know, moneypuck.com is going to regress heavily towards the market. So um i think uh, i think you're gonna see a lot of these prices change but um yeah just just kind of to make note for it for uh, my own my own sake i think it's kind of <laughs> interesting <laughs> i was gonna say i'm surprised you didn't comment you could have coupled them in with that stat leads stat leads uh take because i do believe from what i've seen they do the same thing i don't know if i agree i don't know if i can say for for certain that they they move them when there hasn't been games or teams have been sitting stale but some of the movement is insane. And I do think, I don't know what's up with their model and like the recency bias or how exactly it's situation situated on there, but it does seem like there's some crazy movement in terms of a look and it doesn't make sense. Like a team's cup odds moving so much in such yeah. a short period. Yeah. Now that you bring that up, somebody actually messaged me, somebody in the, somebody in the NHL that works for a team messaged me yesterday and said, um, I think they're regressing their, playoff odds pretty heavily to the market because of the changes that I'm seeing day to day, either that, or they're not running enough Sims. Um, so yeah, no, people are, people are noticing that for sure. Um, I didn't talk about it on the show. I did talk about it on Twitter. I actually, I made an error over the last few weeks and my projections were all fucked up. And, 
unfortunately, the errors that were made were there was about a half a dozen. You know, I there's there's I've got it fixed now, but I, I had a scraper for certain things, certain data entry at the start of the season. It broke and it broke again. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to enter these ones and zeros in manually uh, every day. It takes me five minutes. Not a big deal. Well, I didn't. I had some safeguards in place to make sure that I was entering the correct ones and zeros um, so that I could do a check. You know, once I finish doing the data entry manually that I could say, OK, it's right. I can run the sim now. Um, but for whatever reason, I had messed that up a couple or, or a handful of times and it really threw everything off because the games that I had messed up on were like very, very unfortunate, like a Dallas versus Winnipeg game. So that really changed the central division, uh, standings and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, no, you like, I mean, mistakes happen. I, I messed up, but, um, I also, I don't understand, like, I don't understand what the benefit is of really regressing things that heavily to the market like i i agree that you should use the market as a as one of the you know one of the ingredients uh to your to a model but um i think some of these some of these models are just regressing so heavily that it's like where where does the market end and your model begin right like it's right. almost at the point where you're just copying uh the right. odds that we're seeing so um, and i do I don't think know. too from like a a game score standpoint I feel more common, like I'm not just trying to rip out money puck here because I use it, but I feel more confident in the expected goal scores from evolving in an ST. Like if I look yeah. through an, a slate that I've just watched, like, and I handicapped pretty carefully, pull up their expected goal scores, it's more often that I'm like, what? Like, I, I don't see that one. Yeah. I think they have less pre-shot movement. I know at one point they did. I don't they have know more rebound stuff, that. though, I believe, though. Yeah. I, I think Money Puck has more, more, um, more rebound data in their, um, in their expected goals than Evolving Hockey does, but I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. Yeah, and I mean, I just pool the three, and then also think about what I thought of the game. So it's a whole different process, but for sure. Um, anyways, um, do you also? Um, do you log like the median household income of uh, NHL <laughs> players to, you know, maybe yeah, like... it's high. It's I'm going to tell you every, every, every kid is in uh, Zach Hyman's shoes or maybe not every kid. I don't want to, you know what I mean? But yeah, 95% uh, I, of them. Yeah. Let's talk about Hyman. how Ryan Nugent Hopkins was poor growing up. Why don't we do that? Uh, Bobby Ryan too. I think he was poor. Um, yeah. Those are fun stories. Let's do that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think singling out Hyman, he's gotten the right level of, uh, getting ripped apart for that but it's not like insane. there's another guy that scored 50 goals that very same night who had an nhl player for a father and a first round pick for a brother but uh, yeah i'm sure there's also a zillion kids that had all those benefits and went on to score zero nhl goals that, yeah so. that's and that's that's what i was saying like zach the thing about zach Hyman. and so if anybody doesn't know and you probably do know if you were paying attention to, to hockey twitter on uh, on tuesday um andrew berkshire uh no, mostly, I guess, known for being a, a Montreal Canadiens blogger, et cetera, content creator. Um, but uh, yeah, he made a he made a TikTok video, kind of demeaning Hyman's fifty goal accomplishment, uh, and you know, talking about all the advantages he had. His parents were rich. His parents owned a, what is it, a Greater Toronto Hockey League team? Is that what is it? GTHL, uh, the Markham Royals, I believe. Uh, Jeff Viette, our, our esteemed co-worker, actually. Do you know what his title is, Jake? Is he like the director of player personnel or something like that? Oh, in, in, in junior hockey? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, something like that. He works with the players. He's, you know, part of the manage, the, the, the team management group, I guess. And uh, um, he's had nothing, he has nothing but great things to say about Hyman's family and Hyman and, you know, just how nice they are and everything like that. So I guess as far as rich people go... The Hymans are, are pretty a okay, right? So, <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, no, I just think it's so funny because I think the stereotype of like the coach's kid or the the you know the that stereotype that we've seen played out in so many movies, like the team, the son of the team owner, etc. Um, you know, those guys don't make those guys don't actually tip like 
actually go anywhere most of the time right like so i think there is something to be said about hyman's work ethic and the fact that you know he was able not to have he didn't have an ego coming up through hockey played his role uh the way he was asked to play it etc right i think um you know it's it's a it's a pretty uh pretty crazy uh thing to pick on a guy about considering every 95 percent of players are you know more or less like you said, in Hyman's shoes, maybe he didn't have as many advantages uh, or privileges as, as Hyman. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I was saying to Jake earlier, like, I think like, like Carey Price was brought up yesterday as well, because, you know, while he did, he grew up on a reserve, et cetera. But a lot of people, you know, leave out the fact, I guess, that his mom was the chief, that he was flown into metro areas to play hockey, all that stuff. But I think that's like the least interesting part of his story, right? Like I think everything else about his his upbringing in the game of hockey is way more interesting than the than the fact that he had money. Like everybody has money, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the way to summarize it is it makes it easier. I mean, I work doing skills coaching. I do pl- like I've done plenty of power skating stuff every summer, and I've yeah. had parents of kids that are pretty good. And this is the thing: you got to start doing this stuff when you're seven and eight years old now. And I've had parents specifically tell me that they love the program and they can't do like they can't do all three weeks. They're going to do one week, but they were happy with it and like thanking you. So there's stuff like that. Like it's a fact there's like I think you're kind of wrong to just say it's not. But that's that's the entire league. The kids still got to show up and like put in the work and he's still going to be talented. So and and that's the thing. Just singling out Hyman was absolutely insane because it's literally you could come up with thousands of stories. It's uh kind of just more the way hockey is rather than the way Hyman's life is. Yeah, no. And I just, I just think of course it matters. Like the barrier for entry is, is, um, you know, guarded by, by whether you have money or not. Right. I mean, like um, anybody that grew up around the game has, you know, has seen people pick for teams based on things that maybe didn't matter on the ice. Right. Um, you know, depending on whose, whose parents were, were don't, we're going to donate the much to fundraising initiatives, et cetera. Right. It's like that, that stuff happens. That's life though. Um, and I think when you get to the NHL, a lot of that, that's been all, that's kind of been weeded out at that. Point, oh that, right? yeah. You know? 100%. Like, the best players are getting the jobs in the NHL. Like, yeah. So can't for every, them. for every Zach Hyman that had a bunch of extra advantages and had a little bit extra help and had people around him that really, you know, helped him achieve his dream. There were, you know, a hundred other players just like him probably spread throughout the country at that time that had similar advantages that didn't make it as far as him and that didn't sure. ever amount to anything because they didn't have work ethic and, and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think for Hyman, you know, it would be super lame if he had to say after scoring 50 goals and, you know, asking what his thoughts were or whatever. And uh, I think it would be super lame if he had to say, yeah, you know, I had to work hard, but you know, thankfully my parents were rich. Like, yeah. You know, so remember that kids like, and he's a legitimately good dude. So I don't think he cares. Like, I don't, I don't think he was going to get in that interview and be like calling the idiot out. He just doesn't care. Um, I think the way to put a positive spin on it and the way that Berkshire should have tried to put a positive spin on it would be to say that people should try to help initiatives like kid sport where they can. Yeah. Um, I thought that was like a, it could have been a positive way to, to come out of this idiotic take <laughs> for everyone. But I think that is something like people should uh, keep in mind. For sure. What eight are you? Um, you're you're mostly working with younger kids though like like seven eight year olds yeah and i've done well no i i was doing up to like 18 year olds when i was fully in it but now that i'm doing full-time like writing i don't do as much i still stick within the summer i'll do power skating stuff but we'll go up to like 16 17 year olds um gotcha yeah my uh my son is eight he's gonna be nine in october he just well, we, we had him in skating and stuff like that when he was four and five. He did he hated it. <laughs> and uh and then COVID happened and that kind of you know closed everything down for a while. There was no skating for like an entire winter and stuff like that. And trying to get him to go out on the outdoor rink and learn was was brutal. But I got him out there this year, just over the family day weekend, pretty much got him up to speed and over the course of like three days to where he was skating on his own and doing pretty good. And, you know, within a few more days of skating, he was like, maybe I can play on a team next year. And I'm like, good. I'm yeah, like, you're yeah, through that's the worst great. But at the same time, I'm like, you know, I'm, I started thinking like, okay, like 
you know what? Hockey registration is in May and you just learned how to skate and like you're uh, going to be in under 11. So I think it's probably a good idea if you really want to play hockey and you want to play organized hockey that starting, you know, next winter, as soon as the, you know, as soon as the uh, outdoor rinks are open, we can get to some of the indoor rinks and whatnot too. But I told them like, look, you got to spend a year, like, like an entire winter, like trying to get up to speed, learning how to skate, like doing, learning a little bit of power skating, learning how to stop, learning how to, to do all that stuff. Right. And skate around with your head up uh, at the same time. Right. So I know there's no hitting it under 11 or anything like that, but yeah, still, I mean, it's still a safety. safety you could do thing, it though. Right? There's teams yeah. for every level, right? There is what? I was just saying there's teams for every level. Like if you want. For sure. To yeah. No, in. I just, I just think it would be, you know, kind of throwing him into under 11 for his first year of hockey would be a little bit jarring considering like most of these kids had played uh, U9 for like three or two or three years. Right. So. But that's I the beauty know. of it too. Like I've seen, cause I also work running evaluations here for minor hockey in September or more so before when I was uh, not doing as much writing. And sometimes those are the best stories too, because you see the kids like that that come in and and uh, are like quite new. But then by December they'll be absolutely humming and have like the biggest uh, kind of growth to their game. Yeah, because they're just yeah. people who haven't put in the work previously, and then and then they'll really get going. Gotcha. Yeah, for sure. Anyways, let's get back to gambling. Um, but uh, <laughs> but I do want to. I, I want to. I want to get your thoughts on. Uh, uh, go from talking about youth hockey back to gambling. Um, <laughs> I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, kind of what's been going on um, in the in the NBA and and everything with uh, with this this scandal that we're uh, we're witnessing kind of unfold with with Jonte Porter. Uh, I guess I guess my the only reason I want to bring this up and you know I, I don't want to get too much into it because it's a sticky subject, but. Um, I feel like this problem has been created by the sports books themselves um, in the sense that before pre-regulation, you couldn't get five figures down on an NBA player prop, right? You couldn't yeah. bet uh, Jonte Porter under in four different prop markets and then same game parlay them in game, right? You could not do that pre-regulation um so i think there's an uh, an aspect of these you know sports books um obviously DraftKings is the sports books that's been talked about a lot with uh with the article and everyone everything because they've been uh they were they were the ones that you know released the information that they had lost a bunch of money on this uh this prop or these props but um i think there's a an element of like poor risk management right because our big element because you know if i'm a bookmaker and I have an, uh, you know, like a, a player prop up and I take a, a, a limit bet on the under, well, I'm going to move the line. If another limit bet comes in after I move the line, I'm taking that prop down until I can figure out what the hell is going on because something is up. Right. And, um, you know, so if, if you're, if you're, I think if, I think there needs to be a, a, a bigger emphasis on, you know, traditional bookmaking and risk management at some of these big sports books, because, uh, because this wasn't a problem pre-regulation. I mean, you couldn't, there wasn't enough incentive out there uh, to, you know, bet on it for a, for a player to throw a player prop like, uh, you know, Jonte Porter allegedly has done here. So uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that as somebody who's been like me following the industry for a long time. And have kind of seen all these changes take place. Yeah, I mean, the one thing, I haven't followed it that closely, but the thing that I saw, and you might have more of an opinion on this, is I did see some, like, handicappers who had, like, posted that pick the day of, who seemingly did not have a clue, and who genuinely said the line was a bad number. So that's, I don't really have a lean. I haven't followed it close enough that I'd have, like, an opinion. But I'm just kind of saying that I did see people saying that it was a bad number which happens on DraftKings props trust me some of the hockey ones are like absurd sure, yeah. so is it i don't know like i honestly don't really have an opinion but i'm just saying like is it that insane that they just posted a, a bad line too like i don't know yeah. enough about that was my NBA initial that was my initial thought too is like well it is an obscure player and you know like <laughs> yeah like wasn't it on under 0 0.5 threes how many threes does a player uh, it was, it was under 1.5 threes under 8.5 points i think under 
under 5.5 rebounds and under 4.5 assists, I think were the lines. Okay. Um, but yeah, like I, I'd never even heard of Dante Porter. That's what I'm going to say. Like, this, he, right? so, kind of high. <laughs> who's betting the over on those? I don't know. So I, I, I talked to, uh, an odds maker, uh, friend of mine actually, um, earlier this morning just to get his thoughts on it. And he, cause I, I just wanted to know, like, is my, basically what I had just said, like I told him and I said, like, do you think I'm right? Like, is this, is he's like, Oh, absolutely. Um, he said, um, this isn't rocket science. He said, I've either hung a bad number or someone has information that I don't. In either case, I'm going to take a few minutes to figure out what's up. If I can't figure it out, the prop stays off the board and we lose maybe a couple of units disaster averted. Um, he said, I don't want to speak to Porter's potential motivation or alleged involvement in whatever this has happened. Um, but whatever amount of money the sportsbook let them lose on that prop is on them. If I lose five limit bets on a row uh, on a low level player prop, I've done a terrible job. If I lose 10 limit bets, I would expect my boss to yell at me. I would be fired if I lost that much on stuff like this. Take 1K on player props, maybe 2K. If you want to take 10K on LeBron, Mahomes, McDavid, etc., fine. But they deserve what they got because they are clearly incompetent at managing their own risk. So that's yeah. from a, that's from a sports book uh, odds maker friend of mine out of Las Vegas, um, who uh, is pretty. Uh, well, pretty and do you remember? <laughs> do you remember? I'm sure you could ask him about this too. When it was Draymond was injured, and DraftKings like took a bath on this. Like they waited. Yeah, yeah. For I don't remember the circumstances, but I, yeah, I remember he that was happened. injured and he was going to play like 20 seconds of the game, making all the bets valid, and people knew it. But they had his props on the board, which was completely idiotic, and all these people pounded all the unders, and it was like same game parlays of like all like every under you could get. Yeah, and then they were like refusing to pay them out because they were whatever. Yeah. had their arguments but it was clearly just the same thing of just like bookmaking malpractice that they left those up and were letting all the action get down yeah so pretty wild stuff um that combined with uh, the shohei otani uh situation has just uh, kind of rocked the the gambling world but um yeah i mean there's just like there's some some issues i think out there i think whale accounts so anybody that's maybe not as um up to speed with all the you know gambling lingo and the goings on of the sports betting industry um some of these bigger sports books in the you know specifically in the united states but in canada as well um some of these big retail sports books that you see advertisements for everywhere they actually you know they like if, if you're if you're like there are whales out there there are very rich people out there that have a lot of money they get kind of you know special access, special limits, stuff like that. These are not necessarily winning betters. In fact, I think the sports book feels very confident that they will lose over the long term, um, which is why they're willing to let them bet as much money as they do. Um, but I think uh, I think that is sort of like a loophole in the the sports betting ecosystem right now, where some of these uh, accounts are able to get absurd amounts of money down on in markets that they you know nobody should be able to get as much money. Uh, down on some of these player prop markets as uh, as we're seeing so um yeah i don't know pretty pretty wild uh, stuff i haven't been following it super close but i do think uh i do think some people are kind of like missing the point on on all of this and why this is a problem and maybe it wouldn't be a problem if uh, some of the sports books would take some of the ownership over the you know the market that they've created for this type of thing but before we get out of here uh, I guess I just wanted to touch base on some more hockey games. Uh, anything, uh, anything else catching your eye for Thursday initially? So we talked about uh, how you like the the Vegas Golden Knights in Winnipeg. That is plus one fifteen at North Star Bets right now. Of course, I got two bets for Thursday. I've got um, the Dallas Stars at plus one hundred two. Uh, that's a three quarter unit play, and then I have the Florida Panthers at minus. 172 that is uh to win three quarters of a unit um anything else you like nick oh yeah you've got the the wednesday game too on the senators but anything the else wednesday like game nick? and then and then the one i like is uh there, i mean there's a couple but the last one that i actually think is worth going into that looks a little off uh DraftKings has the hawks at plus 170 tomorrow in ottawa and Ooh. I actually think that's a pretty good bet, which probably sounds contrary to what I just said on the Sens, but I think that's too long. The, the Hawks are still competing. 
I was big on them last night versus Calgary. I thought that number was way off. Um, and I do think that this price is a little long. It feels like, I think I keep coming on this show and saying the same thing about the Sens. And it's actually worked out pretty good for us with the Coyotes and some of these. But this is the kind of spot I want to target fading the Sens in. Like they're just, it they're feels a big like favorite. when they're a huge favorite playing back to back, I could see them getting up for the Buffalo game tonight and playing well. I wish they weren't playing Corpus Allo tonight and then the reverse of that. But yeah. I, assuming the Hawks, play Mrazic and that's the other thing that sucks because this was kind of the conundrum I had yesterday with the Flames game was they were the Hawks were plus 165 the night before I would have loved to have known that Mrazic was going to play but I also thought it made sense to just take the risk that they'd play him because I knew the numbers would all come downward significantly before he was before you got goalie confirmation so you're just going to be stuck with you know like if you waited you're then just going to be betting the Hawks at plus 145 because you you waited for confirmation I think this could be kind of the same spot plus 164 plus 170 looks pretty pretty long to me um yeah only uh only five teams have been uh worse favorites a worse bet as as a favorite uh than the ottawa senators they have won just 14 out of 29 games in which they were uh the favorite for a 48.3 percent win rate not surprising um, <laughs> the two worst teams though this year as as favorites which shouldn't be surprise anybody, the Pittsburgh Penguins and uh, the New York Islanders. <laughs> yeah. And the, the thing with the Hawks too, like they're playing better. Like you look in this month, they're actually across all strengths above 50% expected goals. They've had a super soft schedule, but I mean, yeah. we're talking about Ottawa here. And the one thing that we had kind of talked about, I think, I think we went into a Hawks game last week, Andy, but like they were playing with nobody and nobody, I think paid attention because it's Chicago and now they've got a lot of guys back. Their defense core actually looks pretty solid. I really like Korchinski. I like Vlasic a lot. Seth Jones is actually enjoying a pretty pretty solid run of form. So I look at it, I actually think they're still competing. And I think there's some legitimate reasoning to why they're playing a little better now that they have some of the NHLers they were counting on this year. So looks pretty long to me. I think they're going to come in there and compete. I'll hate to see Arvid Soderblom, but still, I think you just probably live with it. Yeah, and that's 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 one of those things where you know you can kind of get out in front of uh, in front of that when um, a team like Chicago that has had issues that they're not maybe not dealing with now earlier in the season uh, that were plaguing them, and that's a big reason why they have been the second best or second worst underdog bet this season. But um, obviously, that's you know skewed heavily to the way they were playing previously. Um, just going to check here actually really quick before I, yeah. And the last note I'd slide in there too, which I don't think is overly relevant, but who knows what's going on. They are kind of locked in their own little pod in terms of tanking, which is not the worst thing. I don't know if I don't really ever think there's like, I think players are always going as hard as they can and they want to win. I don't think there's ever anything like that, but they are five points below the ducks, seven points ahead of the sharks. They're pretty much locked into 31st. So not the worst note, you know, it's, I mean, it, I, I would feel worse if they were directly tied with the Sharks about betting them, I think. Yeah, yeah. And looking at my uh, my projections for Thursday, I've got the Sens at minus 145. So, yeah, I mean, Blackhawks, uh, I'm going to maybe lock that in myself, too. I'm just going to see what we've got here. Um, like Nick said, well, actually, DraftKings has already moved down. Uh, plus 170 down to plus 164. Uh, that's the same price as FanDuel. Um, Nordstar has already moved down to minus 150. Um, so yeah, I'm going to wait on this one just myself because it uh, looks like not really available in the juris in this jurisdiction, but uh, I'm sure that'll be the case soon. Um, but yeah, Blackhawks are nothing against the Sens uh, on Thursday. So... Yeah, that pretty much does it for uh, Wednesday's live stream. Of course, we uh, we moved ahead the Wednesday sh or the Friday live stream to Wednesday because uh, it is a holiday on Friday this week. Um, I am likely going to post uh, or record and post a video looking ahead to Saturday's NHL odds on Friday. Um, but uh, to be d to be dated. Or sorry, to be determined. I don't know why I said to be dated. I was looking at dates. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, recap some bets here. Nick just 
kind of went over what he likes. Um, and uh, and I'm going to go over my two bets for Thursday. So we've got the Dallas Stars, like I said, plus 102, three-quarter unit play, uh, and the Florida Panthers to win three-quarters of a unit at minus 172. Both of those bets are available at North Star Bets. You can check them out and sign up via the link in the description below. Drop a like on the video if you have not already, and subscribe to the Canada Sports Betting YouTube channel. Also, check out Line Change, the Action Network's hockey podcast. Nick, uh, when do you guys do Line Change? Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but we're gonna we're gonna flip the schedule around here and, and try to get into some uh, of the bigger slates down the stretch because yeah, the Wednesday slate is becoming a little uh, a little tough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> little dull for sure, for sure. Yeah, and of course we've got the the playoffs uh, coming up here in uh, in just a few weeks, and so um, won't be uh, won't be dealing with too many big slates anymore. Just uh, just regular hockey each and every day. So uh, looking forward to that. But uh, but until next time, thanks for joining the show, Nick. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me again, Andy. All right, guys. See you next time.